Good morning. I'm Stephanie Shearholtz from NASA's Office of Communications. We are here at the Kennedy Space Center today to talk with senior NASA leaders. They will share with us not only the significance of the fourth SpaceX Commercial Resupply Services mission launching tonight, but also how it fits in with NASA's broader exploration goals. Here to talk with us today from NASA headquarters are Sam Shamimi, International Space Station Division Director for the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, Dr. Jeff Shihai, Senior Technologist for the Space Technology Mission Directorate, and Dr. Ellen Stofan, NASA's Chief Scientist. It's NASA's International Space Station program that brings us here today for this mission, and Sam Shamimi is here to talk to us about how the research this and future missions will enable humans to travel farther than we have in decades. This mission really shows the breadth of NASA's work and how all the directorates are working together. Sam, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. Uh, first of all, it's a really pleasure to be here, back here in Florida for the, tonight's launch. Um, it's a really exciting few weeks here in human spaceflight. We've had the rollout of uh, the Orion spacecraft for EFT-1 that's coming up in December. Uh, we've also had the announcement of our commercial crew uh, development partners, uh, SpaceX and Boeing, uh, to expand our commercial utilization of low Earth orbit and the development of not only the, the supply side, but also you'll see, uh, talk about a little bit later, about also on the utilization and demand side of the commercialization. And also, this, this launch this evening, as, as Stephanie was saying, really exemplifies how space station's role in the, all the goals and objectives of, of NASA. Uh, first, we can talk a little bit about the expanding the human presence in space uh, beyond low Earth orbit and on to deep space and on to Mars. Uh, that's through our, our human research program, through our research in uh, in with, with the astronauts and with our examples of the rodent research that, that we're also doing on this flight. We're also um, talking about the um, uh, commercial development of, of low Earth orbit through also the rodent research through our partner with CASIS, uh, bringing in commercial users of, of the space station uh, in, in commercial research. Uh, we'll also talk about with this flight, uh, benefits to humanity, how through our, our partners with uh, Science Mission Directorate uh, on the RAPISCAT uh, instrument uh, to measure sea winds. So this has been a really exciting uh, launch for us. It even goes on beyond uh, to uh, our Science and Technology uh, uh, Mission Directorate uh, for technology development uh, for the 3D printer. Uh, th again, uh, all these examples of, of, of things that were flying on this flight uh, cuts across NASA's missions uh, from, from humans to technology to science. And as many of you may have heard yesterday, uh, even into astrophysics uh, with the announcement by Sam Ting about the discovery of new high particle energy physics discoveries. So we have a lot going on in this flight and with, uh, with the International Space Station these days. We certainly do. It's very exciting. And, and coming up as well, I mean, one of the things we talk about is how we're doing these studies for long duration mission, and I think that there's also a one-year mission coming up. How does studying the long-term effects on human spaceflight help us prepare for getting farther out into the solar system? Well, uh, today we have a lot of information and data uh, and research on humans in space for up to six months. Uh, we don't have much, uh, uh, we don't have a lot of data beyond that. So this one year uh, crew mission is coming up next year. We'll be able to tell us if our bone loss and muscle, and muscle loss protocols can be actually applied to longer duration missions. Uh, things like also the uh, medical issues that we've uh, recently discovered about eye health. Uh, we'll see if those issues continue uh, or they end up tapering off uh, in longer duration space flight. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, you had mentioned the 3D printer, and that gives us a, a great uh, segue to Jeff Shihai, who's our senior technologist for the Space Technology Mission Directorate, which found the, the 3D printer. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, the 3D printer is a very exciting technology. Yesterday there was a briefing that gave a lot of detail on the printer and what it's intended to do, what the uh, parameters of the demonstration on ISS are. You know, really, um, the themes, you know, that, that you'll hear over and over are partnerships and using the ISS as a demonstration platform 
And so this is a partnership between NASA and a company called Made in Space. Within NASA, it's a partnership between the uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate, which I represent, and the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, which Sam represents here. Um, so we're proud to be part of that partnership. This printer is really an American success story, if you think about it, in terms of it was a proposal to the Small Business Innovative Research Fund. Um, got maybe $100,000 as, as a start off to explore the concept. Does the concept really hang together? Do you really think um, printing things in space, printing tools in space would work? Then uh, after that success, it looked like the concept was, was sound. Uh, phase two, SBIR award to, to uh, develop the concept further, to try out an initial implementation of the concept. We were able in space technology to use our flight opportunities program, which pairs promising technologies with vendors who offer suborbital flights to put the uh, printer in a space environment for very short durations, 30 seconds at a time, but let them tweak it and test it and determine what parameters they'd have to change to make it work well in the space environment. And now we've got it to the point where we're delivering it to the Dragon capsule. We're gonna take it up to the space station. We're going to uh, have it installed there and do a full demonstration of its capability to actually operate successfully in the microgravity environment of space. So it's, it's really from initial concept all the way to demonstration. And it's, it's a partnership like this that helps carry technologies across what some people call the valley of death that, that sometimes stands between a promising technology and its infusion into missions like, like we want to do in NASA or its, or its transfer to the marketplace. And so partnering like this with within NASA and with uh, companies external to NASA really helps carry technologies along. Um, in the broader context, space technology is doing a lot of things on uh, International Space Station. We have demonstrations inside ISS. We're planning some demonstrations outside ISS. Inside ISS, many people are probably familiar with the, the Robonaut R2, the uh, r humanoid robotic platform, and we recently delivered legs to Robonaut, and so uh, instead of just a torso with the arms and, and the head, the vision capability, it'll also have legs and be able to move around the space station. So we'll be able to start some of that testing to see how, do, how does it move around, what do we need to tweak, how does it uh, interact in the environment that's occupied by humans, how do humans interact with it, and what do humans need to do to control it. And so. That's a really interesting technology uh, demonstration. We have the spheres. Um, the, the world will little note and long forget what the acronym stands for. And uh, I could think, I could, I could remember it if I thought about it for 30 seconds, but let's not. Uh, but they're spherical, the roughly spherical shaped robotic platforms that, that move around the station. And uh, they can take instrument readings, they can take inventory, they can do a variety of things to relieve the crew from some of the day-to-day -day burden of upkeep and, uh, and shopkeeping on, on the space station. So that's a, a demonstration we have on ISS. We've done some microgravity fluid experiments to understand how fluids behave in the microgravity environment that can be used for um, developing large propulsion systems that might sit in microgravity for weeks or months before we fire the engines, for example. And, and of course, the 3D printer demo is, uh, is our latest and greatest uh, demo inside the ISS. Outside the ISS in 2016 and 2017, we plan to deliver a few demos. One is something called Sextant, which I wrote it down, stands for Station Explorer for X-ray Timing and Navigation. What it basically does is use pulsars, astrophysical objects, they're actually collapsed stars, neutron stars, rotating neutron stars as a navigation beacon. We may be able to navigate our way through the universe using things the universe has provided to us as navigation and timing beacons. So that, that'll be a really interesting demo, and it, it kind of ties on to a um, experiment that the Science Mission Directorate has on space station. Uh, so we'll be using some of that capability to do this other demo. Um, we've been uh, planning to demonstrate phased array heat exchangers. Uh, we have a wax-based 
implementation and a water-based implementation. These are devices that use the latent heat of fusion, the fact that uh, substances absorb energy without changing their temperature when they're at a phase change like solid to liquid. And so um, in 2016, we'll deliver the wax-based model, 2017 the, uh, the water-based model, and, and test out the capability of those to store and release thermal energy when, when, you want, when you want it. And then advanced solar arrays. One of the things we're very proud of this summer in space technology, it's been a busy summer for us, so we've done a number of uh, demonstration events, is the advanced solar arrays that we've de developed in partnership with uh, ATK in one case and a company called Deployable Space Systems or DSS in another case. So we had two uh, uh, groups working on, two organizations working on uh, different implementations of advanced high power solar arrays. One of the things as we move out into deep space, we're going to need higher power implementations of solar electric propulsion to move cargo around for us. It's a very efficient way of moving cargo because uh, making an analogy with automobile transportation, you get really high miles per gallon. You don't get much thrust, but you get great fuel economy. And so we can move cargo when we're not in a hurry by contrast with moving crew when we want to get them out there as in a re reasonable amount of time. We can move cargo with solar electric propulsion, but we'll need high power to move a lot, lot of cargo. Right now, the spacecraft that we have in Earth orbit with solar arrays, they have a few kilowatts or tens of kilowatts maybe of, uh, of power, electric power being delivered from the solar array. We'll need many tens of kilowatts, maybe a few hundreds of kilowatts to do something like a uh, Mars mission, for example, probably a few hundred kilowatts. And so um, we're developing the array technologies. We had two great deployment demonstrations. We're looking forward maybe uh, in, in the next few years to trying to do a demonstration on ISS. The possibility even exists that these advanced arrays could supplement the power on the ISS and, and provide a uh, replacement or a supplement for the aging ISS solar arrays. So very excited about that and we're proud to be partnering with HEO on fulfilling the promise of ISS as, as a premier laboratory for space science and technology development and demonstration. ISS is fulfilling that promise every day. And uh, in space technology, we're really pleased to be part of that. We're trying to develop technologies to facilitate the human exploration of deep space, asteroid mission onto the moons of Mars, onto the surface of Mars. And really, at a top level, when you think about it, you've, you've got to get there, you've got to land there, which is trickier than it sounds like. You want to live there. We really intend to set up shop on Mars. We don't want to go and just leave a few boot prints. It's a long way away. Uh, a mission to Mars, a human mission to Mars, will last a few years. You literally have to wait for the planets to align before you can go and come back. Can't go and come anytime you want be, unless you have unlimited energy. So. Um, so we're, we're going to set up shop on Mars, so we have to develop technologies to live there. So in, in space technology mission director, we're working on propulsion, like solar electric, as I talked about, to get you to Mars. We're working on landing technologies. We had a fabulous demonstration earlier this summer of something called the low-density supersonic decelerator. Some people called it NASA's flying saucer because it sort of the test vehicle looked like a flying saucer, but it deployed a, a supersonic decelerator, an inflatable device to help slow the vehicle down, then deployed a parachute at supersonic speeds. The parachute um, came apart pretty quickly. Many people probably saw that video, but, but we learned a lot from that. We know what to tweak. We know what to try the next time. So it's really all about creating new knowledge, demonstrating new capabilities and, and new technologies, and, and that's what we're trying to do in, in space tech. W one more exciting thing I'll mention is, is we recently selected in uh, cooperation with Human Exploration uh, Operations Mission Directorate and to be put on a platform being, uh, that will be delivered by Science Mission Directorate, that is the Mars 2020 rover, we selected an in-situ resource utilization experiment. 
That's a mouthful of words, but what it means is living off the land. And so what we're going to demonstrate is the ability to suck in the Mars atmosphere, which is mostly carbon dioxide, about 95% carbon dioxide, and turn it into oxygen. We can use oxygen for breathing, of course, if you, you're a human and want to set up shop on Mars, as I mentioned, but we can also use oxygen as a very effective liquid oxidizer in the propulsion system that might get you back from Mars. So get there, land there, live there, and then you'll probably want to leave there. And so um, this technology can be used both for living there and, and leaving there. So really excited to be part of performing the first demonstration on another planetary body of using the resources that are there to produce something useful living off the land. So, so in space technology, we're, we're trying to create new knowledge. We're trying to develop new capabilities. We're trying to demonstrate new technologies and really pleased to be partnering with industry and partnering with our other organizations in, in NASA to, to do those things. Great, thank you so much. That's a lot of good information. We do spend a lot of time um, talking about science and research inside the space station, and it's great to hear about science outside the space station, enabled by the space station, and one of those is rapid scat that we've been talking about this week. Ellen, you're NASA's chief scientist. Could you tell us a little bit more, please? Well, this flight with CRS-4 is really showing the um, depth and breadth of the ISS as a research platform. Um, and, and with this flight, again, you're, we're just seeing the increasing maturity of the ISS uh, for research. And rapid scat, uh, which is going to measure uh, surface winds over the ocean, uh, is a great complement to our uh, 17 spacecraft that we have studying the Earth. We were really excited earlier this year to launch two spacecraft, one to study global precipitation, another to study uh, carbon dioxide. And you might say, why do we need all those 17 spacecraft? Why do we need rapid scat to measure? Well, as most of us know, living on this planet, it's a really complex planet. We're trying to understand how the atmosphere is changing, how the surface changes, how that plays into it, how the surface changes. 70% of our planet is covered by oceans. so. We have a hard time actually making surface measurements all across those areas where there aren't people. So being able to use space to get that global view is incredibly important. But because the planet is so dynamic, uh, it really is changing all the time and you're trying to capture that change with all of these instruments. For example, our, we have another instrument that is looking at sea surface winds, but it's measuring at the same time of the day every day. The great complement for a rapid scat is that the space station covers the tropical regions at different times of the day. So we're not only going to be able to get data on how the winds change from day to day, but how they change across the day. And that's really important because if you think of how the weather changes, how the climate changes, a lot of it's due to the energy that we have in our atmosphere. How is that energy uh, taking place? What's the exchange of energy between the sea surface and the atmosphere? And winds are a really critical part of that equation that we really need to measure. So rapid scat on the International Space Station is going to give us good insight um, to increasing our understanding of weather, how that plays into climate over the long term. Really critical measurements that we're making right now uh, to help us here uh, on Earth. Um, and, and this is just one aspect, as we've been hearing today, of what the International Space Station is doing. And, and it's amazing to me when you look at just the, again, the incredible breadth of research that we have going on. Yesterday we announced the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. Uh, they released two different papers looking at the things like the amount of positrons and electrons that are, are coming towards us. Really important to measure them in space because when you have this atmosphere, it kind of messes up the measurement because these particles have mass. And it's starting to give us hints about dark matter, this stuff that takes up the majority of the universe, that we have very little insight into its nature. So really exciting results coming from AMS. And again, who would think that the International Space Station would become such a fundamental platform for doing uh, cosmology studies, the origin of the universe, the nature of the universe. Uh, and as Sam was going into earlier, um, with our commercial partner CASES, um, sending ARC-2 up to the International Space Station. Really a broad range of research going on from things like protein crystal growth to our very important model systems studies. Uh, and I know you guys heard about that yesterday with the work that we're doing sending rodents up, looking at muscle wasting, uh, bone density loss, uh, the fact that when you put things that evolved in a 1G atmosphere up into microgravity, there's all kinds of changes. 
how can we use those changes to help us better understand how the human system operates. And that's critical not just for sending humans beyond low Earth orbit to Mars, where for three years they're going to go out into this low gravity environment, but it's critical because things like bone density loss, muscle wasting, um, at my age I already feel those things coming on. So, um, you know, if we can learn from the fact that those things happen very rapidly in space, learn more about them, learn how to treat them effectively, it will help us here on Earth. Um, and, and that's our, our, our phrase for the space station, which I think is really critical, is it's off the Earth, but it's for the Earth. This research doesn't just benefit us on our journey to Mars, it benefits us uh, right here on this planet. Um, and, and for our journey to Mars, you know, this, this research we're doing is critical. Our partnership with SpaceX, uh, getting uh, cargo, uh, along with Orbital, getting cargo up to the space station is critical because we want to get experiments up there. We want to get data from those experiments back down here on Earth. And earlier this week, um, our big announcement, as Sam was talking about, partnering with SpaceX and Boeing uh, to send commercial crew um, to the International Space Station starting in a few years another critical step on ensuring that in the 2030s we get humans uh, to the red planet. And that's critical for me as a scientist because I want to see uh, geologists and astrobiologists on the surface of Mars trying to really address that question of did life ever evolve uh, on the planet. Um, and you know this is kind of a crazy busy week for us here at NASA from the commercial uh, crew uh, announcement to our launch here uh, in the early hours of tomorrow morning to on Sunday evening. Incredibly exciting, we have the MAVEN spacecraft arriving uh, at Mars, uh, having Mars orbit insertion. MAVEN will be studying uh, the process to take place at the top of the Martian atmosphere, which is really critical for understanding the history of water on that planet. We know Mars had a lot of water in the past, it's lost that water. MAVEN's going to give us this critical uh, measurements to try to understand how that how Mars's atmosphere has evolved over time. Uh, getting back to that question of are we alone and did life ever evolve on the red planet? So crazy busy week for NASA and really focused on this. Let's go beyond low Earth orbit. Let's go on a journey to Mars. Excellent. Thank you. We will now open it up for questions. Um, please identify yourself and your affiliation and to whom you're addressing your question. Irene Klotz. Uh, thanks very much. Good morning. Um, my question is for, uh, for Sam. Um, with the House and Senate passing a continuing resolution for the, um, for the NASA budget, does that impact the uh, uh, first year funding for the commercial crew awards? I think that was addressed um, in the in the discussion a uh, couple of days ago. Is that right? That's correct. That uh, it shouldn't have any effect. I can get you the statement, Irene. Okay, thanks. And, um, I have also another financial question, also for you. Um, yesterday, the um, Inspector General's office uh, came out with their report about the uh, future operations of the space station and expressed some concerns about it being. Um, that NASA was uh, under was um, wasn't really properly um, uh, planning on the amount of money that it's going to cost to keep it going. Uh, just wondering if you had any response to that. Well, we've been uh, working uh, the last couple of years to understand uh, what it takes to keep the uh, station uh, from an operational standpoint and maintenance standpoint. What it takes to do that and. Uh, what we what we expect for the transportation cost to be in the future. So we're continuing to work those cost estimates uh, through our regular budget process. Marcia Dunn. I'm Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for Mr. Sheehy, probably, although you can anyone can uh, chip in. 3D printer. Um, when would you envision, when would you, would you think that um, astronauts on the space station, if at all, might actually use the 3D printer for replacement parts, repair parts? Um, I know there's a commercial unit going up, I think, next year. What's the earliest you could see that happening, and how hard would it be for NASA to get its, its head into um, using a 3D printer part if it's a life and death situation on the space station versus something that's been tested 100,000 times on the ground? Sure, that's a great question. Um, part of the uh, rationale behind doing the demo that we have planned for this mission is to, to get some initial data and, and to do some initial testing on 
you know, what kind, how, what, what is the quality of the parts that come out when you make them in space? And so um, I think the briefing yesterday showed that in addition to some sample parts, they're making a bunch, they will be making a bunch of test articles. Um, some of them look like dog bones and different sorts of test coupons. And so those will be pulled and twisted and, and, and peeled and, and uh, subjected to a lot of tests to determine the quality of the parts. Here on Earth, we're investing in um, de developing uh, technologies to do 3D manufacturing of components of rocket engines, even entire rocket engines. So one of the projects Space Technology Mission Directorate's doing in conjunction with human exploration is, is looking at um, uh, building components out, out of various metals and then putting them in rocket engines and subjecting them to hot fire. Gives you the opportunity not only to uh, build the thing and tweak it and twist it and pull it and determine its mechanical properties, but then how does it last when you put it in the hot fire environment of a, of a rocket engine, high pressures, high temperatures. And so um, I think the experiments being done on Earth and the development demonstration activities combined with the demos we can do in space will give us confidence that the stuff we make by this method, even though it's, it's new and innovative and it's different than machining a part out of a huge chunk of metal, for example, um, do have the durability, do have the um, mechanical and thermal capabilities that um, traditional parts have. And so that's part of the reason for the demo and, and all the other um, t uh, technology development and demonstration activities that are going on in that whole area of additive manufacturing. So uh, what year? I, I don't know if it's going to be two years, three years, five years hence, but um, I think it's a certainty that NASA will reach the point of manufacturing replacement parts, manufacturing tools as needed, and relying on those instead of, not in addition to, um, things that are brought from Earth. If we're really going to set up shop on Mars, we have to get there. We really can't afford to bring everything we need for an indefinite amount of time. We may do that for the first mission, but we'll need to get to the point where we can make things that we need as we go. So we will get there. I don't know if it'll be next year, but it'll be in the near future. Uh, Ken Kramer. Hi, Ken Kramer for um, Universe Today in America Space. Got a question kind of for, for all of you. Um, the IS, about science, the ISS, you've gotten the extension. So what I would like to know is, have you gotten some new proposals now for science and technology now that you've got this extension of at least four years? I um, also would like to know, um, you've talked a lot about the Earth science, okay? I'd like to know, um, what will we be doing, if anything, for the ISS for astronomy and astrophysics? And Jeff, I really enjoyed um, your presentation, too. I, I had a lot of questions you answered, but I'd like to know about these solar arrays. You mentioned uh, augmenting the ISS. Could these possibly be used for unmanned missions in deep space to, for the outer planets, given the limitations of the um, plutonium supply? Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll talk first about solar arrays, and uh, also I'll touch on long-term uh, technology interest in the station. Um, you know, as you go deeper into space, solar becomes a less and less attractive option because uh, the solar flux or fluence falls off pretty rapidly as you get get out. So, um, but yes, the bigger you're able to make an array, the more of that decreasing light you can capture. And so, um, one of the things we're looking at to kind of augment the let's go big in solar arrays is how can you assemble these things on orbit, maybe even reconfigure them. So we're gearing up to do development and demonstration projects in lightweight structures, autonomous assembly, and looking at maybe getting to megawatt class solar arrays. So um, I think, you know, there's a trade always to be made in terms of um, whether you want to go solar, whether you want to go nuclear as you go deeper and deeper into space. And nuclear tends to win out because you don't need to capture that decreasing amount of light, but um, but those are the kind of trades we're looking at, and and developing the ability to make bigger rays is something that we're looking at. In terms of long-term use of the station, 
one of the things that we're really um, looking at is um, the um, environmental control and life support systems. What what we do on the station, uh, you know, is effective, but it requires a lot of upkeep, a lot of maintenance. We'd like to increase the efficiencies of some of the processes for, say, um, recovering water. We recover a lot. Um, you've, you've, most people know about the urine processor assembly, which tries to recover water in, in, in that method. And people tend to giggle about it, but it's a lot of water, and we can recover it and, and put it to good use. And, and, uh, but there's other uh, water that's, that's uh, consumed on the station, if we could recover a bigger fraction of that. Um, oxygen recovery, those sorts of technologies. And so the ISS will be the demonstration platform to implement the next generation of life, life support technologies that get us ready to live on Mars in the 2030s, as Ellen mentioned. And so we see those um, development and demonstration activities going well into the extended life of the station. So that's just one example. Yeah, I'd li like to expand upon that. Uh, not only the technology of keeping humans alive and, and, and healthy, is, you know, the crew exercise equipment is another area that will be uh, developing the next generation technology, the air and, and blood uh, uh, characterization on orbit, in situ measurements on orbit that we would need to keep the crew healthy and things of that nature. Our, um, our partner director, the Science Mission Directorate, has uh, put space station as part of their platforms and their, uh, and their regular research data calls. Uh, we have more Earth science um, instruments being flown to station in the next couple of years. We have uh, uh, proposals for heliophysics, and we have high energy physics like ice cream coming up uh, uh, nec uh, in next year uh, sometime. So we have a quite a bit going on across the directorates, um, not, not to mention on the uh, exploration technology side, for instance, uh, we're doing the robotic uh, uh, the refueling demonstrations on, on space station. We're also going to be flying up a, a sensor suite for Proxops and Rendezvous uh, that will be demonstrating on space station that could be used across the spectrum of spacecraft uh, as we go beyond low Earth orbit. So uh, we have a lot going on, uh, not only in the near term for space station, but we are planning you know, to fully utilize the platform in all, all its aspects from human research to science mission director to te technology to returning benefits to people here on Earth. So. Um, our plates fill, fill, filling up. Yeah, if I could expand. I mean, one of the critical things when you think about um, a scientist trying to conduct an experiment, if you conduct it once, you find something interesting, and it usually doesn't end right there. And so um, for, the, for the research community, having this 10-year extension going out to 2014, um, you know, there are new areas of research that are going to come in that we don't know yet, but a lot of it is that continuity. So, for example, this is our first rodent flight. And so there's already a whole series of plans for how can we expand um, the use of model systems, not just rodents, but also fruit flies uh, and the other uh, um, organisms that we send up plants to really try to get at, okay, you ask a question, you get an answer that leads to more questions you want to follow up. And it's that ability to tell the research community, look, you have this platform for a long time, you're going to be able to follow up on your scientific questions and get an answer. Um, is extremely important. Um, and, and for example, one of the specific examples, um, which Sam touched on earlier, was the one-year mission. Um, when we try to say, all right, we want to send humans to Mars, eight months there, eight months back, sometime on the surface, um, the amount of risks that we have to mitigate um, between now and the 2030s, having the number of subjects up on the International Space Station to gather data on eye health, on cardiovascular issues, immune system issues. That 10-year period is giving our human research program the assurance that they're going to have enough individuals that they can study over the right time intervals that we really know what we're doing when we send humans. You know, the, when the humans get to Mars after eight months, they've got to be able to get out of the spacecraft and start working, and then they got to be able to come back. And so we need to make sure they're ready to do that. And so this 10-year period has given our human research program a really good roadmap um, to get there safely. And that's, that's been critical. And the, the one-year missions coming up are really the, f the first, first part of that. Um, and, and as far as Earth science goes, just later this year, we have a cloud aerosol uh, mission launching CATS that studies little particles in the atmosphere that have an effect on, on weather and climate going up. Um, and we just selected two new payloads in our science that will be going up over the next uh, couple years 
to study, again, various aspects of, of, of this planet. Um, in astrophysics, not just the ice cream payload that Sam mentioned that will be going up, um, but the continuation of measurements on AMS, um, the Alpha Magnet Magnetic Spectrometer. One of the issues with AMS is we're trying to collect these high energy particles, um, and we really need time to go forward for them to really get at this question, are we detecting evidence of dark matter? We're not there yet. We're seeing hints that that's what we're seeing. Um, but the time to collect the data for AMS is really critical. And I think it's really exciting. We're not able to say definitively, yes, we've seen evidence of dark matter right, right at this point in time. All we can say is that we're seeing hints of it. But AMS is going to nail that down. It's just going to take a couple more years of data collection. So stay tuned on that one. It's, it's an amazing platform. Um, and we're really trying to utilize it the best we can over the time interval that we have. And again, our commercial cargo partners are really critical uh, in that partnership going forward, as well as CASIS, our, inter our national lab partner, and our international partners. It's all about partnerships. I think the gentleman in the yellow. Thanks. Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now for uh, Sam. Um, when do you expect to release an RFP for the CRS2 contract and make awards? And also, um, what's your strategy for bridging the gap between the existing contract and CRS2 with extensions to the current providers? And when do you expect to do that? Thanks. I don't have particular dates handy with me. Uh, but there are I can tell you what the strategy is. Uh, the strategy is to make sure that we don't have a gap uh, in, in between CRS1 and CRS2. So we have, um, in the process of extending the current CRS1 um, uh, con contracts that we have, uh, to make sure that we do not have a gap. Uh, we're expecting uh, to be able to uh, bring online the, our CRS2 providers sometime in the 2017-2018 uh, kind of time frame. Uh, James Dean. Uh, thanks, James Dean, Florida Today. Uh, a few questions if there's time. But uh, Sam, first, uh, just wonder if you could expand on the significance immediately, if any, of the commercial crew announcement uh, in just giving you that certainty now about who your providers are going to be. And how quickly do, do you kind of like integrate ISS into their continued development process? Um, is it not till you get to like a test flight, uh, a crude test flight point or, or much sooner than that? Uh, what's been happening, actually, the uh, station program has been integral, actually, to all of the development to date, and, and the station program will be continued through, the, uh, through this contract period, uh, through the certification. Uh, the purpose of, of us going down the commercial crew route is to get crew to space station, and so station is a large part of, of the certification of getting there, providing uh, rescue service, being on station, you know, for six months or so, and then returning. So uh, station is actually integral to the uh, certification of, 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 of our, you know, Boeing and SpaceX partners. I was uh, wondering if you could explain how adding a fourth crew member apparently doubles the science output you anticipate on station. And if that is, in fact, the case, why isn't there a lot more urgency to enable that capability? Um, you know, we've certainly heard it, but you know, we hear more about sort of restoring this capability to launch astronauts and so forth, but not much about how this could well, was, get much more output from productivity from the station. It, it was always intended to expand the the uh, crew size on space station uh, to the uh, to a, a seventh crew member. That was always always the plan. Uh, we have not had the capability. Uh, when we lost the ability, uh, 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 when the shuttle program ended to expand the crew size for 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 periods of time, uh, we we had to rely on the on the Soyuz, as as you you all are aware of. So we are. Um, uh, we would have liked to have it much earlier, but uh, we're happy to get it uh, when we do get it, and uh, that crew member, uh, that additional crew member will be fully subscribed. Uh, how it doubles is basically is that uh, we have uh, the equivalent of one work week of, of a crew time today, 35 hours, at least 35 hours of, of, of utilization time. This additional crew member will dedicate, effectively be able to double uh, that amount of, of work week time. 
So that's, that's basically how it, how you were, we're doubling. The other crew members are 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 uh, you know there's a lot of time the crew has to sleep, uh, they have to exercise, they have to eat, um, they have to be able to uh, maintain the space station in, in a healthy environment. So uh, this this additional crew member will um, uh, be more free, and not that this particular person will do all. He'll be dedicated, but uh, we want to spread out the time uh, more evenly across the crew members. And obviously that's critical. I mean, some of our experiments, like rapid scat, aren't, don't require human tending. But other experiments, for example, like the rodents, some of our plant experiments, some of our materials uh, properties experiments that we do, they take a lot of crew time. And so being able to have that extra 40 hours a week uh, is, is a critical thing that we've sort of been building in. And so to get the commercial crew announcement out this week and to see us on that path, uh, is something the research community is really excited about. Thanks. And last one, Jeff. I don't know if this might fall in your area. Um, if, if SpaceX, as I believe they are, is, is doing their booster flyback, this this flight um, is, is NASA deploying any uh, assets to track the uh, the booster. I think I believe that was part of a um, sort of Mars related um, uh, research on at atmospheric reentry and so forth. Right. We have a uh, effort in, in a uh, topic called supersonic retropropulsion, which is, uh, w would be a means of uh, slowing down vehicles descending to the surface of Mars. Um, and it turns out that uh, SpaceX, in the course of their own investigations into flying back their boosters and, and, and bringing them to soft landing for reuse, is um, actually operating their engines in the precise environment uh, in the flight regime in terms of Mach number that we're interested in for supersonic retropropulsion for Mars. And so NASA has been engaged in the last few flights in um, getting data, um, in supplementing what SpaceX is doing to obtain data, and then in um, uh, with a, uh, agree under agreement with SpaceX utilizing that data um, getting all the data that SpaceX collects and, and trying to see if we need to do our own experiments or if what they're doing is is enough to give us the information we need. So to, to date, it's saved us a significant development effort that we were getting ready to undertake once we realized that we could partner with SpaceX and, and utilize the data sets that they're uh, obtaining and that we could um, deploy some additional assets to help um, collect additional data. We jumped on that and uh, so again that's a great partnership that allows us to uh, develop technologies that uh, uh, it, it, and without having to pay for it twice. Irene? Thanks. Um, Irene Klotz with uh, Reuters. Um, Sam, could you just explain what needs to be uh, flown, if anything, to the station to accommodate a permanent seventh uh, crew member, like a sleeping berth or whatever. And also, um, in the Boeing proposal, at least, includes a fifth seat for a tourist or space flight participant. Um, how many people actually could be accommodated on the station that are not crew members? Thanks. So, we, so the, um, I'll answer the, the last question first. Uh, we have the capability for short periods of time to accommodate additional crew members uh, on board the space station. Um, if you remember during s s shuttle times, uh, we had quite a few extra crew members uh, aboard space station, uh, but the shuttle brought uh, with them uh, their own food, their own water, their own sleeping station, things of that nature. Uh, with the, our commercial crew providers, they're basically bringing up the crew themselves and maybe a small amount of supplies. Uh, so for um, uh, to be able to accommodate, you know, co around a couple of weeks or so, um, uh, we'd have to do, you know, exact analysis on, you know, how long they could actually stay given the particular increment that they're on. Uh, we do something today called uh, uh, direct handover uh, that also allows similar activities with the Soyuz. Uh, as far as what accommodations do we need to, uh, to add additional crew members, obviously they have, we need food for them and their, and their toothpaste and their clothes. Uh, those, ki those kind of things have to, have to be accommodated. Uh, we also have to accommodate an additional sleep station as well. But it's, it's just more of the same. There's nothing, quote, unique about uh, an additional crew member. Other questions? Ken? Yeah, I'd like to follow 
I'd like to actually follow up on this about the extra crew member. So you would probably need, would you probably need then to bring up more payload every year if you're going to have a seventh crew member, okay? Do you need more CRS, you know, flights from Orbital and SpaceX or whoever else um, you choose? Yes, yeah, so uh, our, we expect our, our uh, requirements for, uh, for, for the, our commercial cargo providers to go up in this, in this time frame, yes. And part of it is, is the uh, additional supplies needed for, for, for the crew. Uh, it also is related to utilizing the space station uh, a more, in a more robust way as well. So we're expecting our utilization requirements to also go up in the same time period. So it's a, it's a combination of both. Marcia? Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, um, Space Station question. Uh, in that Inspector General report, it mentioned how uh, cargo, um, with the absence of the Japanese and European cargo carriers, is going to be more of a crunch to get more things up there, obviously. And I'm just wondering um, why, I know these decisions were made long ago, but why were the Europeans and the Japanese limited to such relatively a handful of resupply missions, why aren't they doing more in that regard? And um, how, how worried are you that you can get enough up there to do all the science and keep the seventh person? And I mean, there's a lot going on, as you mentioned, but that takes a lot of up mass. Yeah, so um, our, uh, go back to our original plans. I'll, I'll address the, uh, the European ATV first. Uh, it was a decision uh, that we made that uh, the ATV was providing more uh, uh, propulsive, you know, more um, a propulsion a fuel uh, than the cargo that, that we needed. And it has turned out that the uh, Russians are, are supply via progress uh, supplies enough uh, of fuel for the space station for, for the foreseeable future. So it was a good trade for NASA to go and trade the value of the ATV flights uh, to turn that into the service module. Uh, for the, uh, at least for the first uh, Orion flight. So that was a strategic discussion. Uh, we also knew that our, our commercial part partners would come on online for uh, the first CRS contract, so we weren't concerned that we wouldn't be able to make up the ATV uh, uh, capability. As far as HTV, um, we expect to continue HTV flights. Uh, they're not uh, beyond our current set. We're still in negotiations with the Japanese. To, to supply uh, cargo beyond the current set. So, um, we ex uh, um, so we're still in, dis in discussions with that. So the HTV, we don't, do not expect us to lose the HTV cap cap capability. And again, like I said earlier, our requirements are gonna go up and we expect our commercial uh, cargo providers to pick up that. We have a question here in the front. Uh, yes, this is James Sutton of Space Flight Insider. I just have a question about the long duration mission. Um, you know, Scott Kelly, the American astronaut, and the Russian cosmonaut, um, they're both uh, veteran astronauts, 180 days around there in space in their 50s. Uh, why were they selected uh, to monitor the health effects as opposed to, like, a Reed Wiseman, you know, a, a younger astronaut with, like, a clean slate when it comes to his exposure and, you know, bone density loss and all that? I don't know. Okay, I'll, I'll take a shot. Um, I'm, I'm not a medical expert. <laughs> <laughs> that, be, make, that make, make, uh, make that make that clear. Uh, uh, for, for the uh, for the one one year uh, uh, crew duration, uh, there's a lot of um, if you will uh, constraints. A uh, number of hours in space, uh, exposure to radiation, uh, the right characteristics, and you know all those kinds of things that we had to go through to select a uh, a set of of possible astronaut candidates. Uh, I, I personally do not know all the specifics about uh, those, those conditions, uh, but going through all those conditions, we, we settled on the, the set that we have for our first, for our, for our first uh, one-year work crew. Uh, what, we're, what we're doing is, before we go off and execute anymore, we're going to learn what we don't know, uh, and then we'll go forward to see what's the real effect of, of, of a one-year duration, and then we'll go maybe modify our selection criteria based on, on, on that. You know, it's like someone that doesn't have in the future for another mission, like yeah. a clean slate. Or I, 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 again, we'll 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 learn from from from, from this mission, and then we'll uh, you know adjust as as necessary to get a more broader uh, uh, select, have a, a, a more broader uh, experience base and 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 uh, of astronauts. And we can certainly get you additional information about that. And I think one of the 
cool slash unique things about this is that Scott's also a twin, so we have a number of twin studies that are being conducted in addition to just the one-year mission. Um, I think that's all the time we have for today, so we'll wrap up. Thank you all for your questions and for joining us, and thank you on our panel for enlightening us about the collaborations among your directorates, as well as the exciting missions to come. Of course, you can follow all the regular news about NASA as it continues to explore our planet and uh, go farther out into the solar system on our journey to Mars at www.nasa.gov. For all the news related to tonight's uh, launch, visit www.nasa.gov SpaceX. And stay tuned to NASA TV coming up at 10 a.m. Eastern. We have a pre-launch briefing to update the status on preparations for the launch, which is scheduled for 2.14 a.m. overnight tonight. Thank you.